scripture today is from the second chapter of Nehemiah, page 516 in the Pew Bible, verses 1 through 10 of chapter 2. Scripture reads, in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should not my face look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah, where my fathers are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. They may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I don't often have an opportunity to repeat a sermon in the church, but every once in a while when I have an occasion to get away to speak somewhere, I can a minister of one of my favorite sermons. And this past week I had the opportunity to speak in chapel at Newport Christian High School and one of my very favorite sermons is How to Be a Failure. I have a guaranteed way of making everybody fail and I promise you that if you follow these three rules you will fail every time. And it's based upon the feeding of the 5,000. It's three simple rules. Look at the size of the task, look at the little bit you have, and leave the Lord out of the picture. The size of the task is so many people to feed. The little bit you have is five loaves and two fishes. Leave the Lord out of the picture and you'll be a failure every time. If Nehemiah had followed these three rules, he would have been a failure. Look at the size of the task, rebuilding the walls of a city from which he was removed by four months' journey, 900 miles distance. Look at the little bit he has. He's only one person. So far as we know, he had not been previously in an administrative position. And leave the Lord out of the picture. Leave out of the picture the fact that God was calling him and where God calls, he also enables. But Nehemiah planned to succeed. And so that's the title of my message this morning, Planning to Succeed. There is nothing wrong at all with success. I believe Nehemiah was a successful person. I believe God wants us to be successful persons. The only thing that may be wrong with success is how we define it. It's really important that we define success from the, uh, the biblical perspective. Success is simply knowing what God puts you on earth to do and doing it. Success for Jesus was going to Calvary and dying on the cross. Success meant laying down his life, and rising again from the dead. Success for Jeremiah meant that he should spend his whole life as a voice in the wilderness and finally die in exile in Egypt. Success for him was doing the will of God in being the prophet that was a man of sorrows. Success for King David was coming to a throne and ruling. Success for Nehemiah was rebuilding a city, a city wall. So success can mean different things. But it stems from this one perspective. Success is knowing God's will and doing it. Nehemiah gives us a whole scenario of how to get on with doing God's will. And each chapter feeds into the other. We do wrong to build on the principles of chapter 2 until we've taken into account the fact that Nehemiah starts by finding and finding God's will by being aware of the problem that God has called him to address, soaking that problem in prayer, 
and then readying himself in a position to act on that problem. Now, as we open the scripture today, we find that as we plan to succeed, uh, maybe there is someone else standing in your way from accomplishing what you want to do that is right, or maybe standing in your way from accomplishing what God wants you to do, and we may very well need someone else's approval. Nehemiah certainly did. He indicates, um, for example, that he had to go to King Artaxerxes. Nehemiah cannot rebuild the walls of Jerusalem unless he gets the approval of his immediate superior. Now, this is an important principle. Uh, most of us cannot really be successful in our day-to-day -day tasks or in our relationships unless we have other people's approval. To get hired, we must have somebody's approval. To get a raise, I would generally suppose, unless you're self-employed and have limitless uh, funds, that you have to have someone else's approval. If you uh, ha are in a sales position in a company, uh, you must... Uh, and you want to come up with a, some great project of some kind, you must get somebody's approval. If you own your own business, you must get the public's approval to buy the product. If you want to buy a house, you need to get the approval of somebody to do the financing, unless you have cash in hand. If you're a teenager and uh, you want to get the car for Saturday night, uh, in most families you have to get somebody's approval. Is that right? Oh, no comment on that. Or stay out an hour late, or maybe two hours late. In a relationship, if you are going to have a courtship, you must get somebody's approval, namely the one you want to court. And if you uh, want to mend a relationship, it's hard for just one person to mend a relationship. They may have all the good intentions in the world, but it takes ultimately the approval of the other to really mend the relationship. And if uh, often, too, in the body of Christ, well, not often, I think all the time, in order to function in the body of Christ in some ministry, we need someone's approval. I had to gain the approval of this church in order to be pastor. I need the approval of this church before God to continue as pastor. To teach fours and fives, somewhere along the line, you must get a departmental approval from someone. There's very little ministry in the body of Christ that isn't exercised with either uh, implicit or an explicit approval of some kind. And getting on with what God has called us to do involves gaining others' approval and, uh, and in a right and proper sense. And Nehemiah needed the approval of Artaxerxes. And he was facing a king uh, who was the king of Media Persia. If you, when, when, uh, sometimes a colloquialism, when you, use, when, you, when you describe something that is fixed, unalterable, unchangeable, permanent, even in today's vocabulary, sometimes this phrase is used to describe that kind of thing. And it's called, well, it's like the laws of the Medes and the Persians. I mean, evidently, when the Medes and the Persians made up their mind, their mind was made up. And Daniel found this out in Daniel chapter 6 when the king Darius made a decree that anybody that worships anybody other than him is going to be cast in the lion's den. And lo and behold, when the king found out it was Daniel, he was chagrined, but he couldn't go back on his word because it was the law of the Medes and Persians. So when Nehemiah comes to Artaxerxes and wants him to begin to do something about the situation in uh, Jerusalem, he is wrestling with, uh, with a very tough job. Well, how do you get someone else's approval? Nehemiah demonstrates, first of all, that as you are praying and planning and positioning yourself, you wait with patience, waiting for the right opportunity, not stumbling uh, very uh, hastily or foolishly into it, but waiting with patience. Chapter 2 opens with a phrase, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Ar Artaxerxes. If you compare that with verse 1 of chapter 1, you find that the book began in the month of Kislev. Kislev is uh, equivalent to November, December, and Nisan is equivalent to April. So there's about four months interval between the opening of chapter 1 and the opening of chapter 2, during which time Nehemiah was waiting on the Lord and seeking the right opportunity when the king's heart would be receptive. Are you familiar with the phrase, Lord, give me patience, and I want it now. <laughs> We want instamatic change. We see something that needs to be done, and we Americans are great plungers in. We, we bend our brain power and our hand power to it, and we get it done. I mean, you just can't wait around. You've got to do it now. But there are some things which God calls us to that simply lie as burdens on our heart for a period of time and not, are not immediately, nothing can be done. So there are times when we wait with patience. Nehemiah, then, uh, as he is waiting with patience, is willing to risk 
when the opportunity has presented itself, and the opportunity finally comes when the king notices one day that Nehemiah is sad in his appearance. Nehemiah had not tried to consciously wear a long face. You know, you, some, pe- some people, including myself, you can read their face. Like, you know, you can pretty much tell when I'm, uh, something's going wrong or when I'm tense. Somebody told me, Pastor, when you're tense, we can always tell you start smiling. You know, just I'll give you that as a little clue. Now, that's not uh, the only reason why I smile. But some people, you can read their face very easily. But Nehemiah probably wasn't that way. Uh, one of the job characteristics that he had as cupbearer to the king, it's my understanding of the time, that he would have been selected for his handsome qualities. And the fact that he was near the king uh, called for a person who was optimistic and cheerful in, in tone and demeanor. But somehow this pressing thing on him for four months had without his uh, consciousness begun to weigh on him and the king finally says to him, Nehemiah, something's wrong with you. Now this is Nehemiah's great opportunity to jump in. But Nehemiah admits how he felt. He said, I was afraid. Have you ever been that way when you've been waiting for weeks to witness to a person and finally they crack the door open just a little bit and give you an opportunity to really begin witnessing about the Lord and you, and you, you in that moment of time, begin to wonder, well, you know, maybe I should just hold up and, and it, you know, if I witness now, it's going to throw everything off and, and they'll, you know, they'll begin to think bad of me and it'll spoil my relationship and, 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 and sometimes we walk away having missed an open door because we're afraid to risk when opportunity presents itself. Nehemiah, at this particular point in his experience, could have said to the king, Oh, uh, king, I did not realize I was sad. It must have been the onions I ate at uh, 3 o'clock this afternoon. Or uh, some other kind of uh, reason to gloss it over. But he, he takes his chance. This is the moment when opportunity here is knocking. And uh, he could have muffed the opportunity by denying the opportunity or by inventing some other excuse. As Nehemiah waits now, uh, into this, oppor- uh, this opportunity has come, and it's his moment to speak. Verse 3, Nehemiah says, But I said to the king, May the king live forever. An important part of giving, getting someone else's approval is the exercise of tact. Tact. I, I was telling my 10-year-old, uh, George Paul, that I was uh, one of the elements of my sermon this morning was on tact. And he said, Oh, I know what tact is. And I said, what is tact? Expecting some off-the-wall answer. And he proceeded to give me this definition. Tact is a keen understanding of how to get along with others. I looked at him and I said, you've got to be kidding. I said, would you say that again? He said, yes, it's a keen understanding of how to get along with others. I said, that's right. I said, how did you know that? He said, well, I learned it in school. <laughs> Nehemiah does have tact. He says, first of all, to the king, may the king live forever. It's his way of saying, look, king, no matter what my request is, I want you to know, first of all, that I'm on your side. You know, a lot of people want to slip you something. And it's true, a lot of people, as a formal court courtesy, say, may the king live forever. But, king, I mean it. May the king live forever. And that's an important way of coming to a person, of affirming them and supporting them and being complimentary to them if you're going to ask them something. So he uses tact in that sense. He also uses tact in providing the king an opportunity to think over a question. Nehemiah phrases his need and his request in the, in the form of a question. He says, why should not my face look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Now, I would suggest that's a lot more tactful than saying to King Artaxerxes, King My hometown is in a terrible mess, and um, you know, King, that it was a city of previous rebellions, but I want to go back and build it up. Will you let me go? Uh, That kind of is a frontal approach. Nehemiah is more delicate than that. It's kind of like, for example, in a relationship uh, where maybe a wife wants her husband to spend more time at home. Now, the wife can approach him in one of two ways, can say, You know, honey, it's about time you started spending more time at home. Or she can say, you know, it would really be neat if if we could uh, have a little bit more time to be together. What do you think about that? That gives him an opportunity to think that it's his decision when he makes it, you see. And uh, uh, maybe a a teenager saying, uh, instead of, uh, give me the keys to the car tonight, I want to be out two hours uh, extra late, saying, uh, uh, don't you think... uh, good uh, 
son that I am to you. Uh, if you were in my shoes, wouldn't you want uh, the car this evening and uh, out a couple hours? You know, there is such a, there is such a thing as uh, tact. You know, there's tact in the body of Christ. We can see something wrong in a brother and say, boy, you know, just really read them out for what we may seem wrong instead of saying, you know, I've noticed... I've noticed uh, a situation, and sometimes I have struggled with this area too. Would you like someone to talk with you about this and pray with you about it? Uh, Being tactful in situations allows opportunity for ministry to exist. This is a very dangerous situation, actually, for Nehemiah to face, because uh, Jerusalem had been such a city of rebellion and revolution that... uh, to ask to this, maybe the king could have suspected his motives and wondered, you know, what's going on back there that, that with my, my servant, the guy who takes my wine before I drink it, wants to leave me and rebuild the city. What's he got in mind? So it's, it's, a, it's a situation where Nehemiah has got to be ex- expressly tactful, and he doesn't have any accusation against the king. He doesn't say, look, king, you know, you've got this city lying in ruins now for about a hundred years, and I wish you'd start doing something about it. Gives him, gets him off the hook by letting him have a question. And then, too, he's tactful in his choice of words. He simply reminds the city of the king of the city where my fathers are buried that lies in ruin. Back in verse 3 of chapter 1, Nehemiah had actually been informed of two problems. One, the problem of the Jewish exiles, and the second problem, the city itself was in ruins. But when he talks to the king, he doesn't mention problem one, the exiles, lest uh, the king began thinking perhaps of all those people back there that might foment rebellion. He simply notice, notices that the city is in ruins. And he doesn't even say Jerusalem. I mean, to say Jerusalem would be to remind the king perhaps too explicitly of, of all that's going on. So he, he lets the king be in his shoes. And the, and the Orientals uh, had a great respect for the dead and for ancestors. And so he very tactfully says, you know, my ancestors, uh, the, the city walls are in ruins where my fathers are buried. Don't you think uh, it would be a good idea if I could go back? And as a result of, uh, uh, of that, the king gives permission. Nehemiah didn't even say, look, King Artaxerxes, I've been praying to my God for four months, and you know he's mightier than you. And he says it's okay for me to go. Now, what about you? <laughs> um, best probably when we want to see something moved in our lives or in someone else's life, that we just let our praying between, be between us and God. And if God's in it, then he can move the other Part. I think uh, Nehemiah relied a great deal upon that scripture that the, king, uh, the king's hand is in the heart of the Lord. It's like a water course and he turns it whatever direction that he will. Well, Nehemiah's opportunity comes. He gets the approval of the king and if given the opportunity, Nehemiah is prepared to act. Sometimes we may actually be given an opportunity and then we don't know what to do with it. But Nehemiah knew what to do, verses 4 through 9. The king says to him, and this is a great question. Boy, I think I'd underline this, highlight it, and write it on the walls of my memory. The king said to me, what is it you want? Now, isn't that a profound question? Isn't that contemporary today? Isn't the Lord today saying to you the same question? What is it that you want? Can you identify it? What are you searching for? What do you want? Nehemiah had prayed for four months. And I will assure you that if you've prayed intensively for four months, at the end of that time, you'll know how to answer that question if you don't know how to answer it now. Nehemiah knew what he wanted. The opportunity had been given. Even though he knew what he wanted, uh, Nehemiah does this interesting self-effacing thing here. He says, uh, when the king said, what is it you want? He said, then I prayed to the God of heaven. Now, we know from chapter 1 that he had already prayed extensively. But uh, this latter part of verse 4 is kind of like uh, a mail gram, only it's a prayer gram. He doesn't have time to get away in a room somewhere and fall down on his knees. He has time for just a quickie. And while he's looking at the king and just ready to speak, he sends a quick SOS up. Help, God, now's my opportunity. Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. And how Nehemiah answers in terms of seizing the opportunity that God has given to him to do his will is he first of all commits himself. Verses 4 and 5. Now in chapter 1, when he was praying over the problem, we never saw that he personally became committed to do something about it. And I indicated as I closed last week that often in our prayers, we are a part of the answer to that prayer. Nehemiah now is ready to commit himself, and although maybe he never had an administrative position before, we're not sure cupbearer involved administration, at least now he's ready to take on the task and to personally commit himself. What we get involved in praying about, God involves us in the solution. 
I thought uh, back uh, over my own experience of how important it is to be personally committed. Uh, this Sunday marks the last Sunday of eight years of full-time ministry of pastoring this church. Uh, we actually accepted the church in the early part of February 1971, but we weren't able to come until full-time until the first Sunday of June of 1971. And I... I look back upon that, uh, that er, those uh, early weeks, and I really thought, you know, the church has been without a pastor for some months, and uh, boy, by the time it gets there, and I get there, and a full-time pastor again, things will, things will really just start coming along real well. And it had only been out of a real sense of prayer that God had called us there anyway. He had confirmed it to us after intensive prayer by some remarkable circumstances. But would you believe that uh, within about six weeks after we had come full-time, the church just died? I mean, people quit coming left and right. Uh, that siren reminds me. They all went away, you know. Uh, but about a third of the church left. Uh, the tenants went down to uh, the lowest. I went back to the records. I know the offerings were the lowest that they were in five previous years. And, and I'll tell you, one time I turned to my wife in the middle of this whole thing. I said, do you think we missed the will of God? Maybe we ought to go back to where we came. Maybe it's not too late to get back. But we had such a sharp sense of commitment in prayer that God had called us. And by the way, the Lord wanted to teach us a lot of things uh, in that period of time is why we went through it. But, but I thought, you know, how important this is when we become committed to doing what God has called us to do, that the commitment must be such that we just simply can't be there on the basis of the outward external kinds of things. Commitment must be real commitment. I think too much in Christian work we rely on enthusiasm. We go to a meeting and we get enthused. Thank God for enthusiasm. It generates motivation. Or we get real jazzed about uh, uh, doing some activity in the church, like maybe teaching a Sunday school class. And who wants to teach fours and fives uh, week after week, week after week? And, and we, may just, uh, we, we may just all of a sudden make a real you know, enthusiastic commitment, but when the enthusiasm begins to wear a little bit thin, there's something that must be deeper that undergirds it, and that's commitment of the will. And Nehemiah had this tremendous commitment of his life to God and he was ready to go, not willing to be a sampler and stay with the situation as long as it looked good. By the way, I think if Nehemiah had failed on his mission, God would have still given him success by having him learn a lot through his project. Well, Nehemiah committed himself, and in verse 6 we find that he had a measurable goal. The king with the queen sitting beside him said, How long will you be gone, and when will you get back? Please the king to send me, so I set a time. Now, there's more to this little phrase than meets the eye. Because uh, it's about a four-month trip from Susa to Jerusalem, traveling by ancient standards. And uh, Nehemiah was uh, in Jerusalem for more than just a few months. In fact, if uh, we were to cross-reference to Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 6, the last chapter, we'll find that he actually was gone from the king for 12 years. He was in Jerusalem. Can you imagine go, if, if you were working for the Fleur Corporation and you were the top aide to Mr. Fleur and you went into his top floor office and you, and you said, Mr. Fleur, I, I'm a Christian and I'm very involved in work in the body of Christ and there's this particular ministry I've been concerned about and uh, would you give me permission to go? I want to, to help uh, uh, in this. And Mr. Fleur, being a good man, will say, well, sure, how, how long would you like to be gone? You say, uh, 12 years? <laughs> That's uh, Nehemiah's the predicament. Now, there's something very, very intriguing about this, uh, I think, from Adark Xerxes' point of view, that he wanted Nehemiah back. He had him set a time. Nehemiah's coming in and saying, you know, I'd like to go to the king for a while. And the king just wipes his brow and says to himself, boy, we've been wanting to get rid of that guy for a long time. He's been a bad employee anyway. What a fortunate, propitious thing it is that he handed in his resignation. Take as long as you want, Nehemiah. You don't need to come back. But Nehemiah had been a person who had produced well in his role, and therefore when a person is already producing well in the difficult task God may have assigned them, is ready to move on to some other task where they can succeed as well. Now, I, I believe in this matter of measurable goals uh, rather than uh, goals that are vague and iffy. An iffy goal is I want to be a spiritual person. A measurable goal is I will know that I'm a spiritual person when... Uh, I have really uh, established uh, certain kinds of things in my life. For example, uh, regular times of prayer and meditation of the Word and, and uh, uh, hospitality toward other people and, and uh, uh, 
uh, caring for people that have needs and setting down specific objectives that you want to do that are part of the spiritual life. Nehemiah didn't have some vague idea of what he wanted to do. He had a concrete objective, and he would knew when he got it. He would know when he got it done. The walls would be rebuilt. I always hesitate to share this, and in about the last six years, I think I've only shared it once or twice because it just seems so pie in the sky. But uh, in in our early days of being here, the Lord really impressed it deeply upon my heart that uh, of what could be done if uh, if a pastor would stay in an area. Of uh, for his whole life, you know, not just uh, run and uh, after spending a few years and running out of sermons, then uh, find another church where you preach, preach them all again and save a lot of time. But uh, no, I wouldn't do that. But uh, why did I say that? Oh, Lord, forgive me. Not, every, not, not, not Most people don't do that. I just said that. Uh, but uh, anyway, I thought, what, is, what would it be like? To have a whole whole lifetime in a place. If the Lord tarried out about the year 2000, I'll be I'll be uh, getting close to retirement age. Uh, what if, what if the Lord gave us until the year 2000 here? And and, and uh, Wayne Tesh by that time had joined us on staff, and we kind of you know did some dreaming together of what the Lord could accomplish if we stayed in one place and if we kept ourselves up to the Lord. What would we like at the end of that period of time when we're ready to retire? If the Lord had tarried, he very well may not. And we present and we present ourselves to Him as stewards. What would we like to say? Did we have any goals? Did we have any target? Would we know what we what we uh, uh, would we know what we hit if we hit it? Kind of a thing. And we just uh, we were looking at how the growth of the church and like we said, wouldn't it be neat if we could lead the Lord to cause this church to increase at a rate of about twenty percent a year over the course of our next uh, thirty five thirty six years here? Twenty percent a year is not really all that mu- all that much. It means five people every year bringing one person into the body of Christ, witnessing to a person, winning them to the Lord, bringing them to the body. That's not tough, is it? At the time we began looking at that goal, we had about a constituency in the church of three hundred people. And uh, but we 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 targeted this out until the year two thousand. And you know what it came to? It it meant that by the year two thousand, the church would have fifty thousand people. Well, I don't think I'm ready to pastor a church of 50,000 people. I don't think I'll be ready for that by the year 2000. <laughs> I don't think you're ready to be a part of a church that big. It's fate into anonymity. So we said, well, that, you know, that can't be. Why don't we believe that the Lord will cause this church to grow to a, a size that is large enough to begin starting churches at the rate of maybe taking three to 500 people at one time and setting them down in a community and telling them to grow and believing the Lord to give them an increase? Well, we targeted this all out, and at the end of... Uh, by the year 2000, if the Lord tarried, this church will have founded seven other churches. Those churches, if they grow at the rate of 20% a year, would have founded ten more. And those ten would have founded at least three more. This church would be a great, uh, great grandparent by the year 2000, generationally, in terms of churches. Well, doesn't that sound like pie in the sky? Have you ever heard pie in the sky? One, you know, you'd be a millionaire if you have a penny, and then you double it the next day, and then double the... Uh, the, uh, you know, double that the next day. I think, what is it, 31 days you'll be a millionaire by doubling a penny? Uh, just, you know, it's not one of those crazy things. And who can do that kind of thing? But, you know, as we look back over the last six years, the Lord has helped us meet the goals for the first six years. And uh, why, if the Lord has helped us to attain that goal over the first six years, why can't we believe Him to do it for the next 31 if He tarry? It's a goal at least we can measure. And if we fall short, you know, I don't get hung up by goals that much. I set them out there as targets. But if we fall short, I think the Lord will say to us what he said to David. Well, David, you can't do it, but nevertheless, it was good in your heart. I believe that God wants us to be purposeful people. I believe he wants us to be visionary people and to dare to believe him for doing things in our life. Well, do I have a measurable goal? Well, I know that I have, that I have uh, done what I sought out to do, that God has called me to do when the time comes. And Nehemiah, though, another thing about about given the opportunity is he, prepared to, is he prepared to act, is that intelligent planning undergirded his faith, verses 7 through 9. He basically had two requests of the king. He said, now, king, I need letters of uh, transit to get through the region across the Euphrates. Those governors are going to stop me and they're going to want to know if I have a visa. So I need a visa. And the second thing, uh, he might have needed a visa card, too. Uh, the second thing which he said to the king was, I am going to need lumber. So will you give the guy that uh, is in charge of the king's forests 
some requisition signed by you that allowed me to get the lumber to rebuild the walls. Now, there are some people who go out by faith and don't make any plans. Maybe occasionally God might be in that. But Nehemiah's perspective, I think a more biblically approved pattern, is Nehemiah does not go out and say, we're going by faith and don't have any plans. Can you imagine Nehemiah not having asked the king for a visa permission and the first governor he comes to across the Euphrates stops him and says, where are you going with this company of people? And he says, I'm going to Jerusalem. Oh, yeah? How come you don't have a visa? Well, we're going by faith. Well, why don't you take that faith and go back to Adarxerxes and get the right permission? The presence of faith does not mean the absence of organization. In fact, I think faith is more adequately informed when there is organization, when there are some plans and some agenda for God to really, uh, that God is in fire that God can then bless. Faith does not operate in a vacuum. Nehemiah anticipated that there would be need on his trip. The gracious hand of my God was upon me, he said, as he laid these plans. Verse 10 suggests uh, to us that he was prepared for obstacles. And this is another thing, too. Often in doing the Lord's will, we need someone's approval. If given the opportunity, we must be prepared to act, but we must know as well, when we pursue God's will for our life, that there will be obstacles. In this case, the obstacles in Nehemiah are Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite. Sanballat is governor of Samaria. He evidently uh, was a descendant of persons, uh, Jewish persons who had remained in the land and intermarried, and in the course of intermarrying with people in the land, also had adopted the various religions of the land. His name literally means, sin has given me life. And sin here was the name for the moon god, the local moon god. Sin has given me life. And... Tobiah was probably the governor of what is now Amman, Jordan. These two persons had vested interests in seeing Nehemiah not succeed because they were able to pillage and tax and do anything they wanted to the people that had been left behind in the city of Jerusalem and in the surrounding area of Judah. Can the obstacle that stands in our way of doing God's will be identified? By the way, I'd like to point out that sometimes obstacles are put in our path by God himself. Not all obstacles are evil. Balaam found that out when his donkey started talking with him, that he was madly walking against God's will. Sometimes obstacles are placed there by the legitimate concern and wisdom of other believers. And we would do wrong to simply call every obstacle, every voice of opposition to our particular path, well, Satan standing in our way. Sometimes it can be God speaking to us in circumstances or through other people. We need discernment to to feel the source. In Nehemiah's case, the source of opposition was the, were those who, had, who did not have the interests of the work of the Lord at heart. We might ask this question, does our service for God cause Satan any problems at all? That's a kind of a penetrating question. Has hell lost any sleep over you lately? In your uh, walk with the Lord and in your pursuing of the Lord's objectives for your life, has there been any rattling of the cages of the deeps over what God is accomplishing through you? When Nehemiah began to move, opposition began to be generated against him. Nehemiah was not going to let anything or anyone intimidate him from doing God's will. And there were those, like Sanbiah and Tobiah, and Tobiah who worked by Murphy's Law. It won't work. And uh, when they operated on this principle... They experienced criticism and opposition to a man who was in God's will. Well, as you look at what God is calling you to do in your life, can you identify anyone whose approval you need? If given the opportunity to act, are you prepared to act? And are you prepared for obstacles? So often living the Christian life and doing God's will, I think, can be compared to being a member of a visiting team on the court of someone else. Have you ever been to a, a game where there was a real good team that came from far away and uh, they were playing maybe for the championship and when they go down the court and someone would shoot the basket, no one would cheer. And when the home team went down and shot because the stands were packed with uh, partisans, the place just erupted. But you can't tell the outcome of the game by the size of the noise. You know, the visiting team has to keep on playing if they aren't getting any noise. And a good visiting team 
won't get rattled by the fact that there is no noise supporting them and all the noise is against them and they'll, they can win the game. And they, they often do win the game. Why do they win the game? Because they base it upon their performance rather than on the stands. I think there are often aspects of the Christian life in which we live in an alien world. It's not our home court, so to speak. This world is not our home. We are strangers. We are aliens. We are citizens of another country and we don't get the cheers. But that doesn't mean we're losing the game. <laughs> when Jesus ministered on earth, he didn't get the cheers. He ministered on the court of the alien one. It was not his home turf. Heaven was his abode. But he came and he won. He laid his life down, accomplished his victory in the cross, and rose again from the dead. We can do our work for God whether or not there is opposition, and in spite of opposition, if God has called us to do it. May I urge you to be counseled from the Scripture and to take this to your heart. Let's pray. There's so much creativity, Lord, in this body of people today. So many dreams you have dreamed for us. So many works you have called us to. So many relationships you have asked us to enjoy and to build. So much potential in each one of us. I thank you that you have put this book, Nehemiah, in the scripture to show us how to realize our potential as persons made in your image. That as we dare to rise to challenges you put before us and to callings you place upon our heart, that we can indeed follow you and succeed in doing your will for our lives. I pray, Lord, that real direction and help will have come today from your word to us all that we might be very good stewards of the gifts and talents you have blessed us with. In Jesus' name, amen.